Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Dane Menke. I am the Digital Marketing Manager here at Regenesis and Land Science. Before we get started, I have just a few administrative items to cover. Since we're trying to keep this under an hour, today's presentation will be conducted with the audience audio settings on mute. This will minimize unwanted background noise from the large number of participants joining us today. If the webinar or audio quality degrades, please disconnect and repeat the original login steps to rejoin the webcast. If you have a question, we encourage you to ask it using the question feature located on the webinar panel. We'll collect your questions and do our best to answer them at the end of the presentation. If we don't address your question within the time permitting, we'll make an effort to follow up with you after the webinar. We are recording this webinar and a link to the recording will be emailed to you once it is available. In order to continue to sponsor events that are of value and worthy of your time, we will be sending out a brief survey following the webinar to get your feedback. Today's presentation will focus on a case study on the successful in situ remediation of PFOA and PFOS using plume stop liquid activated carbon. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters for today. We are pleased to have with us Rick McGregor, president of in situ remediation services limited. Rick has over 26 years experience in groundwater and soil assessment and remediation, has worked in over 30 countries, and has authored numerous papers on groundwater assessment and remediation. He holds a Master of Science degree from the University of Waterloo in hydrogeology and geochemistry, and is a certified groundwater professional in Canada and the United States. We are also pleased to have with us today Maureen Dooley, Director of Strategic Projects at Regenesis. Maureen has more than 25 years of experience in the remediation industry. In her current role at Regenesis, she provides technical leadership for complex soil and groundwater remediation projects throughout North America, as well as remediation design, strategy, and business development in the Northeastern United States and Eastern Canada. All right, that concludes our introduction. So now I'll hand things over to Maureen to get us started. Well, thank you, Dane, and I want to welcome everyone from beautiful Toronto. It's a lovely blue sky and a crisp, crisp cold day, but we are ready to get started. And I am really delighted to have Rick McGregor here as our webinar speaker, and he will be speaking on the topic of a field study for the treatment of PFOA and PFOS. Now, I've had the privilege of working with Rick for many years, and Rick and his team at IRSL have worked on many, many Regenesis sites, and they really are our go-to um, go company when we have complicated site applications, and they are our premier plume stop applicator in Canada. And I'm very much looking forward to this presentation that's been prepared, as I believe this is the first full-scale application of an in-situ remedy to address PFOA and PFOS compounds. And I know this talk is full of technical detail as it relates to regen um, reagent injection, as well as the application to address the PFOS compounds. But before I turn this over to Rick, I just want to briefly describe the reagents that will be referred to in today's presentation. Now, Regenesis, as you're familiar with, are involved with the research development and commercialization of environmental technologies. And we specialize in developing these solutions for, um, you know, they say this wide range of contaminants. And you can see by the different product lines that we have that we address bioremediation, is an in situ chemical oxidation and vapor mitigation. In today's presentation, we'll be focused on two, and that'll be the plume stop liquid activated carbon and oxygen releasing compound. Now the plume stop, what is this? The plume stop liquid activated carbon is a sorbent and it's designed to remove and promote degradation of groundwater contaminants. The plume stop itself is, is composed of fine particles of activated carbon that are suspended in water through the use of unique polymer and dispersion chemistry. Now the plume stop is going to behave like a colloid. It's going to bind to the aquifer material and, and ultimately rapidly sorb any contaminant. And that contamination is then in turn biodegraded. So in essence, 
we're going to paint the subsurface with this liquid activated carbon and then then enhance biological degradation. Now I'm going to show you this visual that compares liquid activated carbon with powdered activated carbon. And this is a column study that's been conducted in our laboratory and we've shown this many, many times, but I think it's just really important to understand about distribution. When you're trying to apply any reagent, it's necessary to be able to have it delivered to the locations in the flux zones where most of the contamination contamination resides. And this is something that Rick is going to talk a little bit about in his presentation in some of the field application of the plume stop liquid activated carbon. And again, just to reemphasize that some of the challenges that we are confronted with is our ability to achieve you know, low cleanup standards. And part of that is due in part to the, the idea of back diffusion or matrix diffusion where contamination may be hung up in your finer grain material materials, but your contamination is also present in, in your more permeable zones. And when you're injecting reagents, they're gonna follow those more permeable zones. And one of the advantages of the plume stop and the sorbent is to be able to address and manage the back diffusion that sometimes may occur at some of our sites. So once you have a contaminant that's been sorbed, you know, what's next? So the the idea of the plume stop is you're going to sorb this contaminant but you want to be able to promote a biological or even an you know an isker sort of reaction so the the plume stop itself or the surface of that is going to act as a matrix to promote bio to promote the growth of the microbial communities quite often we're going to co-apply an electron acceptor or an electron donor in, the case, in this case that will be presented, oxygen releasing compound was applied with a plume stop to help promote aerobic biodegradation. Now with the PFOA, PFOS compounds, there's no biodegradation associated with that and that's sorbent only, but I'll let Rick uh, discuss the details of the presentation and get into that further. So anyway, without any further ado, I'll pass this over to Rick and the person that you're here to, here to listen to. Thank you, Maureen. Um, and I'd like to thank Regenesis for allowing me to do this presentation today. Um, so today we're going to concentrate on a field study that we did in central Canada. Um, it was done in the spring of 2016 and there's been monitoring since then. So we've been about a year and a half into the monitoring events. Um, we're not going to spend a heck of a lot of detail on the um, background information as most of you probably are very familiar with PFOS. Um, and PFO and what they can do in the environment and the uh, causes and how they're put into the environment. So we're going to try to concentrate in the essence of time just on the um, study itself. Um, my email is on there or, or people at Regenesis can also pass you on if you have any questions after the, the seminar. So a, a brief background is obviously we're dealing with um, per and polyfluorinated uh, alkaline substances or PFAS for sh short. Um, two of the more common ones uh, or more familiar ones are the PFOS and PFOA, um, which are probably the most two discussed and most two studied of the compounds out there. But that said, they're just two of probably thousands of compounds that exist in the environment or have been um, uh, um, manufactured. Um, why are they of a concern? Uh, they've been shown to bioaccumulate um, and that has raised all sorts of issues in the last 10 or 15 years and concerns. Um, from an environmental point of view, um, we have really serious challenges with trying to detect these um, compounds in the environment due to the low detection uh, rates and limits needed. For example, the EPA has put out a health advisory limit of 70 parts per trillion or 70 nanograms per liter, which is extremely low. Um, other challenges with these compounds are, is, are the fate and transport within the subsurface that is not really well understood and with studies just really coming out in the last two or three years. Um, I've listed here three of the more, uh, what I consider uh, more the intensive studies done and they're excellent studies with uh, Dr. Weaver at Harvard who uh, did some work at Cape Cod as well as uh, Anderson and uh, the people at um, Colorado School of Mines as well as people at um, 
out in Minnesota. So these are three excellent papers that discuss fate and transport in various environments of the PFOS compounds. So the EPA kind of uh, estimated there's about 6,000 Americans exposed to uh, uh, PFOS compounds in the U.S. due to groundwater issues. Um, where does PFOS come from? Well, it's it turns out it's Basically, uh, we found it in repellents for fabrics, as well as coating reagents, as well as uh, firefighting foam used at airports, military bases. So it, it potentially is quite well um, widespread, and due to its low um, toxicity levels, it could be um, a serious uh, issue for us to address. So typically, we look at PFOS right now, and how is it treated? It's usually done by pump and treat, uh, with plumes being controlled by pump and treat. As most of us know, pump and treats generally can be effective for uh, the containment of groundwater plumes. It's not effective for um, the remediation of groundwater. When we do pump, uh, bring it to the surface, uh, it's generally treated with activated carbon, and that's most common. It's generally the least expensive option uh, available, but the carbon itself does require disposal or regeneration once it's uh, um, consumed. Other, uh, this isn't a complete list of things, but other things are ion exchange resins, which are very effective, especially at low concentrations where you have dilute plumes, but it can be very expensive. Now, it can be regenerated, but once again, that's an uh, expensive and timely process. Uh, there are membrane filtrations, which once again are very ener energy intensive and thus can be very expensive. Those are three of the more common treatment trains. There are others out there that are being done. But once again, they're relying on bringing the groundwater to the surface, which can be uh, very expensive and generally will not result in uh, remediation of the plume, but instead just capture and containment of the plume. So we'll talk about the uh, in situ treatment. There, there's a variety of uh, reasons why in situ really hasn't been used for PFAS. One is is uh, there's very very limited demonstrated options, especially in the field for uh, using uh, the treatment of PFAS. And one of those is is one of the more common methods for in situ treatment is chemical oxidation. Chemical oxidation can be quite challenging for PFAS compounds just because of the uh, carbon fluoride lawn, which is very resistant to chemical oxidation and that's very stable. Um, that makes the compounds great for its uses, but unfortunately doesn't make it great for uh, derogation both chemically or biologically. Um, also, we are required to get to very low concentrations, usually sub 100 parts per trillion, which um, anybody who's done remediation knows that's very hard to do. And one of the reasons it's very difficult to do is uh, due to the back or matrix diffusion problems that we have over time. Um, some of the technologies that have been uh, are being done in the lab or even limited field are some of these technologies I've listed here where uh, a chemical oxidation process um, being tested by Arcadis, and they, I think it's called Scissor. Um, there's been some work uh, on nano palladium and zero valent iron activated for sulfate using heat or base activation. There's some vitamin B12 work being done as well as activated carbon. And by activated carbon, I mean the injection of activated carbon in subsurface. So activated carbon, which is what we're gonna concentrate on today, um, as we discussed before, it's very well uh, demonstrated for above ground treatment, um, but for the in situ use is it's um, just recently, probably within the last four or five years, being, we've been able to actually effectively inject it into the ground. Um, so the challenge is, of course, for the in situ is, is we really are still learning about the fate and transport of the compounds themselves. So we're really not quite sure how they behave in the subsurface. So unless we really understand how they behave in the subsurface, it's very hard for us to uh, remediate them if we don't really know where they are. Um, and there's a term here I call injectability, and that's just my term for how easy is it for us to get the reagent that we're trying to inject into the ground. Um, this is a practical thing is that an applicator, this is one of the most important things we look at. Um, there are some great chemicals or reagents out there, but they're very hard to get into the ground. Um, so they're what I call injectability is not great. Um, that falls into the distribution. As anybody who's done in situ remediation knows, 
the distribution of your reagent in the subsurface is probably the hardest thing we deal with. And that's due to the heterogeneity of the subsurface itself or the aquifer, uh, as well as things like the injectability of the compound itself, as well as its persistence in the ground. Um, we're, I'll t concentrate on that uh, parameter quite a bit in this talk because I think it's one of the key reasons why in situ programs succeed or fail um, in the field is because of this distribution challenge. The other thing with activated carbon is, is it's its lifespan. And by lifespan, I mean um, it's it's got a limited capacity. It has so many absorption sites. Now, those number of absorption sites uh, depends on the type of activated carbon you're using as well as the uh, grain size, which affects the surface area. There's a variety of different uh, parameters that affect that. Um, but that capacity differs for different compounds, and especially for PFOS compounds. There's literally thousands of PFOS compounds, so the absorption isotherms for each of those compounds is going to vary with time. Um, one of the PFOS is one of the more readily absorbed compounds versus the uh, shorter chain hydro, uh, PFOS compounds, which tend not to absorb as well. That said, they still will absorb. They're just, they will break through your carbon sooner than later. Um, if you have co-mingled plumes, like such as the site we're going to talk about today, where you have other uh, petroleum hydrocarbons or chlorinated hydrocarbons present, you will have competition for those absorption sites. So you're, um, that makes it very difficult to estimate timelines for your lifespan of your um, carbon because you have lots of competition for those absorption sites. And then the other, the other factor that we'd like to look at is, is we're not really destroying the PFOS compounds when we absorb it onto carbon, we're just making them unavailable. And by that, I mean, they're not, they're we remove them from, from the groundwater and putting them into the salt phase or absorb phase. Um, from a risk point of view, usually our risks are involved with either vapor or groundwater. So this can be very effective for uh, cutting off that transport pathway. However, at the end of the day, we are not looking at, uh, we're not destroying the compounds themselves. And finally, and one thing that really has been no work done on, um, Dr. Carey had got into it a bit a couple months ago when he did a previous uh, webinar about back diffusion of these compounds. Um, especially at these low detection and detection as well as uh, regulatory advisory limits, back diffusion could play a very big role in how successful we are in the remediation of these compounds. So I'm going to talk about a bit about diffusion, uh, I'm sorry, distribution. Um, this is not from this uh, field site, this is an air field site that we had the opportunity of um, looking at the, uh, what I'll say the injectability and distribution of two um, types of activated carbon. Uh, we're looking at liquid activated carbon, which in this case is plume stop, and then we also injected a powdered activated carbon. And now this powder was very fine grain, but it is still a powder. Um, and what we did was take this plume, now this is not this site, this is a different site, but we took the uh, two types of activated carbon and we injected it literally, uh, split the plume in half and on one half we injected the liquid activated carbon and on the other half we injected powdered activated carbon. And then we went back and did cores uh, set off a certain distance from the point of injection and we looked at the distribution of the activated carbon within the soil itself. So we wanted to see two things. One is we want to make sure that the carbon was going where we want it to, and I call that the target zone. So on these graphs, you'll see dashed lines basically at about 1.7 meters and 2.1 meters. And that was our target zone. In this site, we had petroleum hydrocarbons that were within that area. So we wanted our activated carbon to go into that zone. Um, the second thing we wanted to do is, is what was our radius of influence? Um, that is, of course, we all have to assume a radius of influence when we do a design. And, you know, most common we see is about five to 10 feet radius of influence. So we wanted to confirm that radius of influence was a valid assumption. So what we did was we did the injection and then the same day we went back and actually took cores uh, about uh, two feet, uh, five feet, 10 feet, uh, et cetera, from the point of injection and then took samples every six inches in those cores and we submitted them for analysis um, to see if we could actually determine the content of activated carbon as well as uh, to look at it as. As you can see from these uh, plots, uh, which are depth on the 
y-axis and concentration along the top. I didn't put the units in, but we're we're talking about uh, one to uh, 0.1 to 0.3 weight percent of the uh, core itself being um, activated carbon. Um, you can see here for the liquid activated carbon, we were very we had very good uh, distribution within our target zone, and we actually did detect a slight hit of activated carbon, approximately seven meters, which would be about uh, 22, 23 feet from the point of injection. The reality is, is we've probably seen it about five meters away, which is about 15, 16 feet. So we had excellent distribution and we had excellent um, radius of influence on this uh, for the liquid activated carbon at this site. For the powdered, what we've seen was a very uh, basically a spike uh, where we've seen very, we got it within the target zone, but we've seen basically one very high concentration. It was about two to three times higher than what we've seen for the activate, uh, liquid activated carbon. But for the powdered, we only seen it really within one sample within the core, and that was very consistent right out to seven meters. Um, the picture on the right just shows a band that's about a two inch band that you got a picture there. Of, and you can see the, actually the activated carbon within the uh, sand itself. What we think here is when we went back and did uh, detailed hydraulic conductivity measurements of the sand, we actually have a zone of approximately one and a half orders magnitude higher hydraulic conductivity within that sand scene. And so what happened when we injected the activated carbon, in the powdered form here, is the activated carbon found the preferential pathway and went into that sand scene. Uh, whereupon, for the same site, uh, when we did the liquid activated car, we got a, uh, it appears to be a little better distribution in that sand seam. Even though you do see the spikes where that sand seam is, you don't see as pronounced uh, distribution within that sand seam for the liquid activated carbon. So distribution in this case, um, you know, it's a very important parameter and you can see the effects on it here. Um, the lifespan, so this is the area, important part with the activated carbon is, is what it, will it absorb and will it stay on? Um, this is a batch test that uh, Regenesis was uh, generous enough to uh, provide me when they were doing some isotherm testing for various PFOS compounds. And what they see, what they found was, is that all the compounds they tested did absorb quite well. Um, even the uh, PFBS, which is a four chain uh, PFOS compound. Uh, while it didn't absorb as well as the PFOA, the C8 chain, it did absorb well and they did see uh, basically 99.8% absorption, going from a very high concentration, approximately 100,000 nanograms per year, down to approximately 190 nanograms per year. So they, they did see very good absorption. However, it does show that you do get better absorption, which would be predicted by the isotherm uh, predictions of the heavier chain or higher chain high, uh, PFOS compounds versus the lower chain. So this is another thing that you need to keep in uh, mind when you're doing it. A lot of times, and you see on this study, the, the compounds we actually analyzed for for the first year were just PFOS and PFOA. Um, the last sampling we did at 18 months, we did increase the number of compounds we were analyzing for to try to address this. The other thing we, is very important when you're injecting activated carbon is, is the particle size, which is the direct, which directly affects the, absor uh, the number of absorption sites, the surface area of the activated carbon. This is extremely important in the activated carbon because the main process you're relying on is uh, absorption onto these carbons, uh, onto these sites. So the more sites you have, the better, the more you can absorb on. So this is uh, taken from uh, Tom Higgins and his colleagues at uh, Colorado School of uh, Mines, a paper just recently published, where they, they looked at basically different types of carbon and different types of grain size. In essence, without looking at it, and they looked at PFOA versus PFOS absorption. Um, as, as you would guess, PFOS does absorb better than the PFOA, which, which we would expect, but you also see a very drastic on the graph on the uh, right, you see a very drastic difference between a uh, coarse grain material, which are the uh, graphs near the top um, of the uh, near the top, versus the finer grain, uh, my, uh, finer grain activate carbon down in the red uh, circle dots. Um, on this case, you see about 30 times more absorption. 
Um, it's note here that uh, the fine grain uh, carbon they use here was about uh, less than 53 micron. Um, the plume stop itself is about one to two micron. So uh, once again, we've stepped down in our order main to grain size, which you would expect would correspond to a greater surface area and thus more sorption capacity when we talk about the plume stop. This uh, uh, scanning micron, uh, electron microscope photograph is courtesy of Regenesis once again. It, and it, it's, a, it's a simple photograph or two photographs, that it, it, but it's very, very informative. Uh, the photograph on the left is sand grains without uh, prior to injection of the plume stop. And the photograph on the right is uh, the sand grains with plume stop after injection. You can see First of all, you can see how fine grain the plume stop is itself and how it coats the sand grain. So this is how it would work in an aquifer. So um, once you inject in the aquifer, you would see it distribute under the pressures that you would inject it under, but then fairly shortly within days to a few weeks, you would see it uh, drop out of solution and start coating the aquifer particles himself, which is what we want to do. So now we'll, we'll get into the site here. Um, I'm going to take credit for the site, but um, the reality was it was a bit of an accident when it comes to the PFAS uh, remediation. Um, so it was a petroleum hydrocarbon spill, and that's why we were contracted to go in and remediate the residue petroleum hydrocarbons in the groundwater, and there was some still in the soil. The, the main source of the spill was excavated. Um, the residue concentrations in the groundwater were, you know, BTEX was about 300 um, parts per billion, uh, F1, which is kind of equivalent to the gasoline range here in Canada, is, was about two milligrams per liter, where the F2, which is equivalent to the diesel range, would be about 3.5 milligrams per liter. So not whopper concentrations, but well above the regulatory guidelines here at this site. Um, just prior to us, so we had to design the program to, clean, uh, to address these uh, petroleum hydrocarbons. On the day we arrived at the site to do the, uh, uh, the injection, the uh, consultant on site happened to mention that there was an old fire training uh, pit, basically, they had used over the, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and the building itself had been used for fabric coating once upon in, in its history. And that kind of triggered something in, my, in myself. So we quickly went out and grabbed some samples and we submitted them for PFOA and PFOS. Um, prior to us doing the injection of the plume stop, and in this case, plume stop in ORC. Um, lo and behold, when we got the results back, uh, we did find some PFAS, PFOA. They weren't dreadful highly concentrations, but still well above the advisory limits here. You see about the PFAS, we had about 1,500 parts per trillion, whereupon the PFOA, we had about 3,200, 3,300 uh, parts per trillion. So not dreadful concentrations, but not low concentrations either. So as anybody who's done this type of work, you know that it's very tricky how you do the sampling. You have to be very careful. But so I thought I'd put this in to hopefully answer anybody who would have these questions later on. But we were looking at, uh, we followed the US Air Force protocols for the sampling. We only used high density polyethylene bottles and tubings to do this. We obviously didn't filtrate the samples and we tried to minimize the headspace. And we, even though biodegradation is considered a, uh, Important in case of PFAS, we try to minimize the holding time to less than five days. Um, analytically, I'm not an analytical chemist, so I will just glance here, but the uh, chemistry was analyzed using uh, liquid chromatograph mass spectrometry, and that's a very good method for low detection and conflict matrices. Um, if anybody's done this, one of the challenges with these compounds is the analytical. Um, the samples themselves can be quite expensive to do, and to uh, get these low detection limits that you require uh, can be quite a challenge for a laboratory. So these are some uh, contour plots of the concentration of PFOS on your left and the PFOA on your right for um, before remediation was started. We put on the little square hatch box there where we thought the fire training area was. If it's a very small area, here you're seeing a uh, size of the plume itself was about about 25 to 30 meters, which is about 100 feet, by about 10 meters, which is about 25, 30 feet. So not a big plume. Um, the axis here correspond to a property boundary, but um, of course, nothing flowed off the property boundary. Um, everything stayed on site in this case. Um, but 
we these are the concentrations. So we, you can see the plume itself is fairly well defined. The big black dots represent wells. Um, and as the reason we had wells to the north or on the top of the page was is where we're dealing with both a hydrocarbon plume in this case that was our main concern here so the geology of the site was a glacial fuel deposit i.e it was a sand to silty sand um, quite typical of this area in central canada um, it did have some sand lenses in here about two centimeters thick so those were a major concern when we're doing the injection but uh, when we do the injection, we used a special tools to try to overcome those type of heterogeneities within the aquifer itself. The hydrogeology, a very shallow water table, which causes us some concern as applicators because you get too shallow, you don't have much confining pressure, and then you can have a lot of daylighting, which you can lose a lot of reagent to the surface. It was obviously an unconfined aquifer, hydraulic conductivity about 2.6 meters per day, with a gradient, a quite a high gradient, 0 0.06, which worked out to a velocity about two feet per day, which is a fairly high velocity. Um, for our calculations that we use the effect of porosity of about 0.2. So we had a fairly high uh, groundwater flow at this site um, in a very shallow. The act for the geochemistry, for you geochemists out there, we have a fairly high alkalinity. Um, so it's a fairly hard act for from a water point of view with about 300 to 400 milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate uh, within the groundwater. The act for itself, uh, the plume itself was uh, very anaerobic. It was nitrate oxygen depleted with iron sulfate reducing conditions. So we did see some iron. Uh, most of the sulfate had been depleted, but there was some iron, uh, ferrous iron present within the aquifer itself. The site was located near a major roadway, so we did have some uh, salt contamination, and that was once again one of the concerns with the, with that effect, the performance of the activated carbon itself or the plume stop was these uh, higher concentrations of sodium chloride within the groundwater. So as I said earlier, the source was excavated. Um, Dr. Carey, in an earlier presentation, had did some numerical modeling for the site and had estimated the source mass flux to be about 1.8 grams per year. So not a very big uh, mass flux at all, but uh, that's for the PFAS, but still uh, significant enough to be well above the, uh, regulatory, uh, the regulatory guidance number for our area. So when it came to the remediation options evaluated, now the, we have to put this in context, is we're looking at the petroleum hydrocarbons as being the main contaminant here. Uh, the PFAS were basically, I don't want to say a researchy type topic, but it was uh, our main focus was the petroleum hydrocarbons. So we looked at pump and treat, we ruled pump and treat out just because we, the client wanted the site cleaned up and we just did not think pump and treat was going to get us there anytime soon. We looked at air sparging SVE. We ruled the air sparging out just because we did have diesel range fuel uh, carbon, hydrocarbons present, which would not, uh, the air sparging is not ideal for those. Um, we did look at chemical oxidation. Um, and once again, though, we have a very low, that this site had a very low in, uh, regulatory limit for the F2 value of about 150 parts per million. So we did not use chemical oxidation just because we thought it'd be a very challenging site to get that low in the time frame that they wanted. We did look seriously at enhanced aerobic bile using your chemical reagents such as ORC, as well as adding oxygen versus uh, injection, using oxygen or using something like the Waterloo emitters that would put oxygen in the ground. Um, we also looked at sulfate reduction, but we didn't think that would uh, get us there in time. We looked at thermal, the cost for thermal was just too much, and then we looked at activated carbon or absorption. We also looked at zeolite for this site as well. So we, in the end, we chose liquid activated carbon. Uh, why did we do that? Well, it's a couple of things I, I don't want to say were working against us was it's, it's still fairly in its infancy. Um, there's about 100 sites worldwide that it's being applied at. Um, we've been fortunate in Canada to apply it at about 20 sites. So we had fairly uh, good experience with it and it's performed excellent for us in, uh, when we've used it. So we are very comfortable with it. We've been applying it for a couple of years. So we are very comfortable with it. Um, and the reasons we're very comfortable with it, it has what I call excellent injection properties. So this goes back to the injectability of the product. It, it behaves, uh, once you dilute it to your injection concentrations, it basically behaves very much like water. It's like injecting water. So it doesn't have the suspended particles in it. It doesn't have a viscosity or a density issues, like things like permanganate or percarbonate, these things that are harder to, it injects very easy. 
once again, it has a very high surface area with the activated carbon. So it has a very uh, high potential to absorb things. The other things our client like was is potentially, and most of the time we design for a one-time application, which means it, it would be very quick and remediation could be done very quickly. Um, it's very less disruptive because we used a direct push. So we're in and out of the site to say it's an active site. So we're in and out in two or three days and then we're done. And of course, what most clients care about the cost. So we were able to do this cost for about $75,000 Canadian, which it's about what, $75 American. Um, no, it's about $60,000 $60, American, but still fairly reasonable for this remediation. Um, the injection methodology we're using was, um, we use based on pore volume. So we went for about a 0.3 pore volume. We did it in one event, as I said earlier, direct push. We use geology specific tools. And that just means we use tools that we have designed that uh, minimizes the effect of heterogeneity while trying to maximize how we get things. We used a very dense in, uh, injection network, about a three meter or 10 foot grid. Uh, we do multiple intervals. So we did two vertical intervals to make sure we maximize vertical and lateral distribution. We went in at fairly low pressure, about 25, less than 25 PSI. And at each, at each interval, we inject about 100 to 200 liters per location, which is approximately um, 20 to 50 the uh, gallons per location. So not, we did a lot of points, small volume points. Um, so we, we were going after both plumes and this is just a symbol on the bottom showing the plume. So we're going to concentrate on the bottom part, the P4 and PFOS plume. We're not going to look at the uh, hydrocarbon plume. Um, but for both plumes, we put in about a, a 725 kilograms of the plume stop itself, the liquid activated carbon. Um, and enhance that with 440 kilograms of oxygen releasing compound. Um, that oxygen releasing compound, as Maureen pointed out earlier, was not to address the P4, P4 and PFOS, it was to address the petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, that was mixed in 7,800 liters of water and we injected 50 locations. For the PFOS plume itself, of that total we did, about one third of it is 290 kilograms of the uh, plume stop went into that plume, it also, because we did have petroleum hydrocarbons in there, we did put 176 kilograms of um, oxygen release compound, which was in uh, about uh, 3,000 liters of water. So we went in about 10% for the plume stop, which is a fairly common concentration. Um, and within the uh, PFOS plume itself, we in had 20 injection points. So evaluation criteria was budget, which is always important, distribution, short-term and long-term results. So the budget, we did 50 locations, took us three days. We didn't have very minimal daylighting, so that just means we didn't waste product in areas we didn't want. And as I said earlier, about $75,000 Canadian or $60,000 American. And that was done on time and on budget. So from that point of view, we were very successful. Of course, that's the easy part. Distribution, which I always consider the most important. So I've blown up the plume here. So what we did was we looked at really two, uh, three things. We looked at, we took course to look at the radius of influence, and we looked at, did we get it where we wanted to get it? And did we get overall coverage, i.e. did it go in areas where we weren't injecting? So we took a variety of cores in the various areas. So this just shows uh, vertical profiles of overall coverage. So you can see the orange dots that we took between injection points, which is about, uh, we use a 10 meter, uh, 10, sorry, 10 foot grid here. So these are about five feet from any other injection point. And you can see once again, the dotted lines rec uh, represent the zone of in, uh, the target zone we wanted to inject, and we took five cores. As you can see here, we were were very happy with the, the plume stop went where we wanted it to go within the core itself, and we did see excellent distribution throughout the plume itself. Wherever we took a core, we seen the plume stop, and we were able to verify it was there. So uh, from that point of view, we seemed to get good overall coverage. When we looked at the radius of influence, once again, similar thing, but as you can see down in the plume map on the bottom of your screen, we basically did what I saw a similar study we did before, is we just take cores and we walk out from a point of injection. And then we, once again, we look at vertically, did the plume stop go where we want it to? And, and how far out did it? So we did see it approximately 15 feet from the, we, well, we actually did see it 15 feet from the point of injection. And we've seen the concentrations up to about 0.4 grams per kilogram, which is very good. Uh, the 
detection limit for this type of analysis, which I won't get into, it's very difficult, this type of analysis, it took a long time to figure out how to analyze for this, but uh, it was about 0.1 grams per kilogram. So we're about four times the detection limit. Which brings me to this curve is, how do we know we're actually detecting activated carbon within our cores? So we worked with a lab up here in Canada and we did some standards and the standard curve there is on the right and you actually can see we actually had, so we basically spiked sand samples, um, Ottawa quartz sand and sand with uh, plume stop, the no amount of plume stop, and then we had the lab analyze those sort of uh, spikes if you want to look at it that way. And then we went back and we did, so you can see here we got a very good standard curve. So we're pretty confident we were uh, we could detect what we were injecting. Um, their question is, is what was the FOC of the site versus the basically the total organic carbon from the plume stop? Um, as you can see from the two graphs there, those graphs are taking similar samples and we analyzed the samples for FOC before the plume stop was injected, then afterwards we analyzed for the uh, total carbon uh, which had the plume stop in it. And you can see that we're, well, we're over order magnitude greater, about 30 times higher concentration once the plume stops in the core than with the natural FLC of the core. So and this just shows some of the statistics for you uh, mathematicians, statisticians out there, but you can basically at the end of the day, we took 45 samples for each and we did it within the target zone and without the target zone. And you can see there's a basically a, 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 a almost two and a half times more uh, higher concentration within the target zone than outside the target zone for the total organic carbon. For the FLC, once again, basically the FLC throughout the core was fairly uniform. So we took 10 samples and you can see it really didn't vary that much throughout the vertical. And overall the uh, total organic carbon after plume stop injection was about 35 times the FLC concentration. So the short and then what most people are probably here is the short and long-term chemistry. Um, so what we did was we took samples three, six, nine, 12, and 18 months after uh, the injections. Uh, so I'm gonna call short-term anything less than a year, long-term anything after one year. So we only have one sample event from 18 months, which we just collected earlier, late last month. Um, for the first three, uh, first four monitoring events, we just analyzed for PFOS and PFOA. The last sampling event we analyzed for uh, some extra PFOS compounds, as you can see them listed there. I won't go through all the letters for an essence of time, but um, anybody who likes to do alphabets, you can name these off later. Uh, we've also did a fair bit of detailed inorganic chemistry, and we've actually did some biological sampling using next generation sequencing, and I won't talk about those right now, um, but those are become very interesting, those results too. So these are uh, uh, courtesy of Regenesis. This is just the pre-injection concentrations at uh, six, uh, six wells within the plume. And you can see that the concentrations vary, uh, vary but you know, this is the pre-injection. Post-injection, what we see is after three to 12 months, uh, we have non-detect for the uh, three, we haven't detected any PFOS or PFOA for the first year after injection. They're all non-detect sub, uh, which just means our detection is generally about 20 to 30 parts per uh, trillion at this site. Um, at 12 months, we did get some detections for the BTEX and F1 compounds, but they were still well below the standards that we we're shooting for. Uh, the graphs on the right, if anybody who is uh, attending Dr. Carey's uh, seminar in October would recognize those. Uh, Dr. Carey just did some very interesting modeling to show that once the plume stops injected, that all the PFOS, PFOA would basically absorb onto the activated carbon versus being in the dissolved phase or absorbed on organic uh, matter within the aquifer itself. Um, I highly recommend you download his uh, presentation if you have, uh, as it's excellent and it helps us predict uh, what's going to happen in the future. So after one year, this graph's kind of boring because after one year, we had no detections of PFOS or PFOA after one year as any of the wells. So they're all less than 20 parts per trillion. Um, so that was all great news. Um, so long-term results, and these results just came in uh, basically last week. Um, so there was 18 months after injections, um, and they're very encouraging. So uh, we did have, of all the wells we sampled, we did have one hit for PFOS. Um, of 40 nanograms per liter, which is still just above the detection limit, but well below the uh, regulatory guidance number. So uh, every that was in one well. 
Um, and we did, for all the other compounds that we analyzed, we did see a hit for the PFUNA um, acid at just at the detection limit itself at 20 uh, parts per trillion. So the act for itself is uh, the remediation seems to be performing quite well. We're 18 months in and really uh, we haven't seen, well, we, I guess I can't say we haven't seen any evidence of PFAS, but we've seen one well that has a bit of a hit, just a very minor hit in it. So, uh, so far, so good. Um, so what's going to happen in the future? That's always the million dollar question. Um, and once again, I refer you to Dr. Carey's uh, modeling. So what he's did is taken the results from the thing, uh, from our field studies and tried to predict and model the future. Um, and the results, I'll let you go through his presentations himself, but they're very, very interesting. What he's basically found is, is uh, based on some very conservative uh, assumptions, we should not see anything leave the source zone or migrate down gradient for well over 100 years. Uh, he predicted the PFOA, uh, the concentrations after 100 years would be one times 10 to the minus six parts per trillion, so non-detect. And the PFOS, we might just start to see it after 100 years at 24 parts per trillion. So um, very, the modeling suggests that uh, we shouldn't, uh, remediation should be successful here. So preliminary conclusions for the site um, is that liquid aquate carbon or plume stop in this case was very effective over the short term and by short term I mean 18 months and counting for the removal of PFOS and PFOL as well as for some of the other PFOS um, compounds that we've now analyzed for. Um, one of the things that we'll be working on is, okay, it is absorbed, but it's not destroyed. So will it stay on the activated carbon? So that's leading us to some of the work that we'll be doing in the future is we'll be looking at, will it stay on the activated carbon? It should. It has a very strong affinity, but maybe some of the shorter chain PFOS compounds might be a thing. Uh, Dr. Cherry's looking at some of the longer term behavior, including the back diffusion issues. And well, it's being reported that bile degradation of the PFOS and compounds doesn't occur. Um, one of the things we're looking at is with the activated carbon, does that promote uh, increased microbiological activity near the activated carbon itself? So we start to look at that itself. So that basically wraps up the presentation today. Um, this is being all part of a PFOS remediation remediation group that we have uh, started up here in Canada, which uh, has a couple of academic members right now, University of Toronto and Carleton University, as well as a couple of industrial members, ourselves and Dr. Carey's Pour Water Solutions. So um, we are trying to actively do some remediation and hopefully it leads to interesting things. And finally, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge a couple of people I stole a lot of figures from, was Dr. Carey himself and, and Jeremy from Regenesis. So with that, I think uh, we're probably ready for some questions. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, that concludes the formal section of our presentation. So at this point, uh, we'd like to shift into the question and answer portion of the webcast. Before we do this, just a couple reminders. First, you will receive a follow-up email with a brief survey. We really appreciate your feedback, so please take a minute to let us know how we did. Also, after the webinar, you'll receive a link to the recording as soon as it is available. All right, so let's circle back to the questions. Um, first question here, uh, this one has a lot of acronyms, so please bear with me. It is, uh, does plume stop retard PFBA, PFBS, PFPEA, PFP, sorry, um, get in here, um, PFHXA commonly found in AFF PFAS signatures? Do these PFAS compounds require additional management compared to the longer chain PFAS compounds? That's the question. Well, I can't answer all those uh, compounds. Uh, the, I showed a slide near the start of some of the isotherms or that uh, Regenesis has been working on that showed uh, some of those shorter chain um, PFAS compounds, which show that they are well, they are absorbed. They obviously do break through faster than the longer chains, but they are absorbed. And I think some of the shorter chain ones, I think they're they're absorbed at 90, 98% at very high concentration. So yes, you would expect them to be absorbed. It's just a question of how, how long they will uh, be absorbed for. So they will have breakthroughs sooner 
than some of the longer chains, but you would expect them to be absorbed. So uh, I, I can't go through every compound, but uh, some of the people at Regenesis might have done some more experiments with some of those specific compounds that be able to, or there might be some papers out there. But one of the challenges here, and you sort of your question outlines it quite clearly is, is there's a lot of compounds out there and every site has its specific ones that we're of concern. So um, unfortunately we can't analyze for everything right now. I know there's some analytical methods out there uh, one's called a top method, which tries to get a grasp of how many an overall view of the um, compounds available. But um, I hopefully that kind of answers your question, but I know I can't answer it totally directly within this hour. I'll I'll just this is Maureen. I'll just add a little on that. Um, you know, with the isotherms, uh, we do have some software internally that we can uh, have a multi-component. Um, we, we can we can look at you know many different components and different isotherms to try to get an idea of of how you know how much sorption capacity we would have so we can try to at least model um, you know a particular site to be able to achieve in in, in and then um, adjust the the application rates as needed to try to meet the objectives of the specific site okay great all right, so uh, let's see. Next question here, and this uh, question is uh, about that first um, example that you showed, Rick, uh, comparing distribution of uh, plume stop liquid activated carbon versus the powdered activated carbon. That's what this question's about. Uh, and it's it, the question is, how was the reagent injected, specifically pump and pressure flow rates in each case? So in that case, is we try to keep it uh, from an experimental point of view. We try to keep everything uniform, i.e., the pump pressures, the pump uh, flow rates, and the method of injection were all kept separate. So they're all injected by direct push using a, a, a low pressure, about 25 psi, with a flow rate of less than 20 liters per minute. Um, that was just to try to keep everything um, the same. I do know that for a powdered activated carbon. Uh, some of the manufacturers out there recommend it's injected at higher pressures and a higher flow rates to keep it suspended. Um, but in this case, uh, we try to try in order to look at keep the parameters similar. That's the way it was applied in this case. So um, yes, it, it can. In my personally, I would think if you're going to higher pressure, higher flow rates, the heterogeneity may may or may not be overcome. I mean, that's going to be a very state specific question. But in this case, at this site, we kept all the parameters the same as best that we could. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, next question here is, how do you explain the 40 parts per trillion PFOS concentration after 18 months? That's a tricky question. Um, it, you know, it's, we're dealing with such low concentrations here, parts per trillion, that is it a laboratory artifact or is it a sampling artifact or is it real? Uh, yeah, and it was just in one well of all the well samples. So, um, you know, we're treating it as a real number. Um, so it might just be, you know, if you want to think positively, it just might be a one-off and hopefully the next sampling event it, it disappears. Um, or it could be, maybe it could be the start of a trend. Um, Right now, with one data point, it's kind of hard to guess. Uh, I, you know, the laboratory numbers look fine, so I don't think it's a laboratory error. It may be a sampling byproduct, but you know, once again, we're very careful how we're sampling. Um, so I, I think right now we're treating it as a real number, but for one data point, we'll see what the next data point comes in. If it goes up, then we may have a trend. If it goes down, then we it might just be an artifact type thing. So unfortunately, I don't want to go too far out online right now based on one data point at one well of on the site for five sampling events. But sorry, I can't really answer your question. That would be a crystal ball grazing on that one. All right, thank you very much, Rick. Uh, let's see here. Um, next question is, what is the estimated plume size limitations on controlling the injection to get effective treatment in a fine to coarse sand aquifer? I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but um, if you, you know, heterogeneity, this is in general, this just isn't with plume sop or any, this is with any reagent, it's uh, heterogeneity always controls 
the success usually of an injection. Um, and there's some things we can do to overcome heterogeneity, but in a lot of cases, heterogeneity is something we have to deal with. Um, and that comes down to pressures, flow rates, number of injection points, as well as, and that, by that I mean vertically and laterally. A lot of times, vertical injection points are overlooked. Um, we see a lot of times where people are trying to inject over 10 feet and use one injection point to cover a 10-foot vertical. Um, in our opinion, we like to break that down. The most we like to inject over vertically is two to three feet and use multiple points vertically. Um, once again, you can get in discussions about top down versus bottoms up versus different types of tools. Um, it gets quite complex. Uh, at the end of the day, your applicator sh should be able to help you, advise you on which best way of doing that. Um, and of course, that comes down to detailed site assessment is a lot of times these one to two inch sand seams, coarser, and they may be just one or two ores, may too high or hydraulic concave, they will control where things go in the subsurface. So those are the things that really we find when we have better characterization of sites by the consultants, we get better treatment. Um, it really comes down to that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, let's see here, next question is, when you collect groundwater samples from monitoring wells in the midst of uh, the plume stop injection area, what do you see in the water? Do you see any of the black plume stop carbon suspended in the water? Yes, definitely after the short term. Uh, if we try to sample two or three weeks after, we'll definitely see. We did try to sample, I think, about three weeks after we did the injection. We just had plume stop was definitely suspended in some of the wells. Um, Discussing with the lab that that was going to be a major issue, um, so we decided not to submit those samples, and we waited till three months. And by then, all the plumes up had uh, uh, basically been removed from the groundwater, and the groundwater was basically back to its natural turbidity, for lack of a better word. So, um, in this case, um, we've never tried to analyze any of the samples immediately after or shortly after the plume stop just because uh, the water itself can sometimes be quite gray or in some cases black, um, in which case that causes some issues with the laboratory. Okay, great. All right, thanks very much. Uh, let's see, uh, we still have some time for some more questions here. So uh, next question is, uh, what other types of sites has plume stop been used on? Have they all been PFAS contaminated? Uh, just speaking for us uh, up here in Canada, for in situ, uh, this is the first site that we know of that's been had PFAS. So that's the only one of the, uh, I think we've did about 22 sites now. Um, the other sites have been a mixture of chlorinated solvents and petroleum hydrocarbons. I would say maybe 60% petroleum hydrocarbons, 40% uh, chlorinated solvents. The geologies we've injected plume stop in is anything from a glacial till to uh, glacial fluval deposits and that sort of thing, um, and even fractured limestone and uh, metam metamorphic rock. So we we've got quite a bit of experience and it's it's worked quite well in quite a wide variety of geology. So um, you know the nice thing, and I keep I don't like to keep going back to it, but what I call the injectability of this product is it's a very easy product to inject. Um, so, I mean, from that point of view, I, I don't mean to make it sound simple, but that is one of our biggest challenges in injecting products is, is how well does it go into the ground? And then once it goes in the ground, how well does it distribute? And in this case, uh, we find this product actually distributes very well in the ground and injects very well easily into a variety, variety of geologies. Oh, just one comment I want to add, and it's a question that came up, and it was in, you're talking about the uh, plume stop getting into the wells. It is a common practice after the application to flush the wells and get it in, and to re remove some of the carbon in the in the wells. I don't know if you want to comment on that, Rick, but that's I know that's a common um, practice that, that that we utilize. Uh, we yeah, at this site we did do a small flush afterwards. We um, and that's one another reason why we left it for three months. Uh, the flush we find also for the ORC because the ORC can, I don't want to say clog up the wells, but it can call, clog up the wells if it gets in the well. So we try to flush it right afterwards. But we're not talking, in this case, we usually talk 
uh, maybe two to three gallons at most. And we put a tracer in, before anybody asks, we put a tracer into our water that we flush out the well so that when we sample, we analyze for that tracer to make sure we're just not sampling water that we inject it to flush out the well. So we know the water we sample is aquifer formation water. So um, to answer that question before it gets asked. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and thank you, Maureen. Uh, that's going to be the end of the chat questions. Uh, we're out of time. So if we did not get to your questions, someone will make an effort to follow up with you. Um, if you would like more information about environmental remediation services from IRSL, please visit irsl.ca. And if you need immediate assistance with a remediation solution from Regenesis, please visit regenesis.com to find your local technical representative and they will be happy to speak with you. Thanks again to Rick McGregor and Maureen Dooley and thanks to everyone who could join us. Have a great day.